Welcome back to Aero 1020 Theory of Flight, presentation number 15 on drag. In this presentation, we'll discuss the fundamentals of drag. We'll review the four different kinds of parasite drag, which include pressure drag or form drag, skin friction drag, interference drag, and cooling drag. And we'll also review induced drag, what causes induced drag, and ground effect and how that affects induced drag. So just to review the four forces that are acting on the aircraft in flight, remember out of the four forces, drag opposes thrust. During constant speed flight, when an aircraft is neither accelerating or decelerating, the two forces of drag and thrust are equal. If you've ever stuck your hand out of the window of a moving car, your hand is moving through air. And remember, air has mass. Air contains molecules. And so air has density, just like a solid object. So as your hand is moving through the air, that solid mass of air is creating drag on your hand. As your hand travels through the air, say at 10 knots, you may feel a little bit of pressure on your hand. Dynamic pressure is the pressure of moving air. If you increase the speed to 40 knots, that will increase the dynamic pressure by 16 times. So an increase in velocity will increase drag or pressure exponentially. In addition to velocity contributing to dynamic pressure, air density also has an effect. At the same airspeed, low density air will create low dynamic pressure compared to high density air. So any object moving through air, which has mass, is going to experience some resistance to that motion. That resistance is drag. So the definition of drag is the resistance to airflow. And again, when thrust equals drag, the airplane is in unaccelerated flight. When lift equals weight, the airplane is flying level. It's neither climbing nor descending. So let's review the different types of parasite drag. Remember, there are four types of parasite drag. The first one we'll discuss is pressure drag or form drag. If you consider a flat plate in motion in the relative wind, that flat plate is going to create some disturbance or uh, some turbulence. Because of that turbulence behind the plate, the air pressure is lower than the air pressure in front of the plate. And that differential pressure causes what is called pressure drag or form drag. Now we can reduce pressure drag or form drag by streamlining the shape. We could add a sphere, which will reduce the turbulence behind the sphere. We could add a, a fairing behind the sphere, which will further reduce the turbulence. Or we can just place a sphere inside of a housing or a fairing that streamlines in front of the sphere as well as behind the sphere. And that will reduce the disturbance or the uh, turbulence even further. So as you can see in this graph, as we gradually improve the streamlining of the plate, drag decreases from 100% down to 5%. And that's because of the reduction of the turbulence behind the object. Remember the term laminar flow? Well, a laminar flow is smooth flow of air over an airfoil. And that smooth flow of air minimizes drag created behind the airfoil. Remember, as we increase the angle of attack of an airfoil, we also increase the amount of turbulence that's produced behind the airfoil. Remember, that starts at the trailing edge, and as the uh, angle of attack is increased, 
that turbulent flow actually moves forward closer to the leading edge of the airfoil. Just like the sphere at the top of this figure, that turbulent flow creates drag, and the more turbulent flow created, the more drag is created. So we can reduce the amount of drag produced on an aircraft, for example, by the landing gear, by adding fairings on the landing gear to streamline the landing gear so that we reduce the amount of turbulence produced therefore reducing the amount of drag. And you can increase the airspeed of an aircraft by as much as 5 to 10 knots just by adding fairings. Another problem that can increase drag is ice. Icing on an airfoil, changing the shape of the airfoil, can reduce the amount of laminar flow, increase the amount of turbulent flow, and therefore increase the amount of drag being produced as the aircraft moves through the air. The next type of parasite drag is called skin friction drag. And skin friction drag is the aerodynamic resistance or the resistance of air due to the contact of moving air with the surface of an aircraft. If we were to take that flat plate and tilt it so that it's parallel with the relative wind, we would reduce pressure drag, but there would still be skin friction drag. And it's because air has viscosity. Uh, we don't normally think of air as being uh, viscous or being sticky, but it does have viscosity. And that viscosity increases and decreases. So again, we can reduce form drag on the plate by tilting the plate so that it's parallel with the relative wind. But again, we still have skin friction drag, which is a second type of parasite drag. So how can we reduce skin friction drag? An aircraft might look like it has a smooth surface, but microscopically uh, the surface is rough. We can try to reduce skin friction drag by creating as smooth a surface as possible on an aircraft. On a metal aircraft, however, because the metal plates need to be attached to the frame, that requires rivets and you may recall seeing uh, the surface of a metal aircraft like a Cessna 172. Uh, these rivets create bumps on the surface of the aircraft which increase skin friction drag. Uh, carbon fiber aircraft or composite aircraft uh, are, don't require rivets so they're a lot smoother and that reduces skin friction drag but the surface is still not perfect and so there is still some skin friction drag produced on a carbon fiber or composite aircraft. Here's an example of a metal aircraft with rivets. And as you can see, those rivets uh, create bumps on the surface of the aircraft, and that increases skin friction drag. We can reduce the skin friction drag by uh, building an aircraft with composite materials. You see the difference between a composite wing and a metal wing uh, in this uh, figure. The picture on the left is a picture of a metal wing with the rivets and the picture on the right is a picture of a wing made of composite materials which is smooth, smoother than the um, metal wing but still, as I said before, it's not perfect, so there still is some amount of skin friction drag being produced on a composite aircraft. The third type of parasite drag is interference drag. And interference drag is caused by the intersection of airstreams that create eddies, currents, turbulence, and restrict airflow. And these restrictions occur at the intersection of the wing and the fuselage. Whenever you have a 90 degree angle on the fuselage between a fuselage and the wing or the fuselage and anything else attached to the fuselage you get interference drag. We can reduce interference drag by adding fairings at these intersections. Wing fairings, gear fairings, they all reduce interference drag. The fourth type of parasite drag is cooling drag. And cooling drag is really a type of pressure drag or form drag. Most light aircraft 
that are piston powered have air cooled engines. The cylinders need to be cooled by air so on most light aircraft you'll find openings like the one pictured here on the Cirrus SR20 that allow air inside the engine compartment to flow over the engine to cool it. And that flow of air inside the engine compartment causes drag and that's called cooling drag. We can reduce cooling drag by adding cowl flaps to the aircraft. Uh, cowl flaps can be opened by the pilot to increase the airflow through the engine compartment and that would reduce cooling drag. Here's a picture of a cowl flap that's open. The pilot can open and close the cowl flap to manage engine cooling. Uh, so when they want to increase engine cooling, they can open the cowl flap and that will also reduce cooling drag. One very important thing to remember about parasite drag is that as airspeed increases, parasite drag increases. So when an aircraft is slow at a high angle of attack, parasite drag is low. As the aircraft speeds up and the angle of attack is reduced, parasite drag increases. Induced drag, on the other hand, is produced by lift. The more lift that a wing creates, the more induced drag it creates. So in this figure you can see as the angle of attack is increased, of course angle of attack increases the coefficient of lift and increases total lift. As total lift is increased you can see that induced drag is increased as well. The downwash created by the wingtip vortex is what actually creates induced drag. The vortex at the wingtip is caused by the difference in pressure below and above the wing. The high pressure below the wing seeks out the low pressure above the wing. And at the wingtip, that creates a vortex. That causes the air to spiral around the wingtip. And that spiraling uh, vortex creates turbulence behind the wing. That turbulence behind the wing created by the wingtip vortex is what creates induced drag. It's the primary source of induced drag. Because of the pressure differential between the upper and lower surface of the wing, the spanwise flow of air on the undersurface tends to travel from the wing root out to the wingtip, and then on the upper surface, it tends to travel from the wingtip back toward the wing root. That spanwise flow of air is what creates the wingtip vortex. Now these vortices are created all along the length of the wing, but they're strongest at the wingtip. And they're created on fixed wing aircraft as well as rotorcraft, like helicopters. Remember, the rotor on a helicopter or any rotorcraft is actually just a spinning wing. So induced drag is different from parasite drag in a couple of respects. Induced drag is created by lift. And as the airspeed of the aircraft increases, induced drag decreases. Parasite drag, on the other hand, increases as airspeed increases. So an aircraft flying slow at a high angle of attack produces more induced drag than an aircraft that is flying fast at a low angle of attack. Remember, angle of attack influences the coefficient of lift. The higher the angle of attack, the higher the coefficient of lift. So an aircraft that is flying at a high angle of attack at a slow airspeed actually creates more induced drag because it's creating more lift. So how can we reduce induced drag? Well, we can increase the aspect ratio of the wing. Remember, a uh, wing with a high aspect ratio is long and narrow. And because it's long and narrow, it creates less downwash than the wing with a low aspect ratio. A low aspect ratio wing is wide and short, and it handles more air than a wing with high aspect ratio. 
because of that it doesn't create as much aft downwash for the wingspan and that translates into weaker wingtip vortices and as I said before the wingtip vortex is a primary reason for induced drag. So the high aspect ratio wings that you see on gliders uh, produce less wingtip vortices and as a result they produce less induced drag. Another way that we can reduce induced drag is by attaching a winglet to the end of the wing. A winglet decreases the wingtip vortices by increasing the effective aspect ratio of the wing. And remember, wingtip vortices are the primary uh, reason for induced drag. So if we reduce the wingtip vortices, we'll reduce induced drag. The vortices are still produced, they're just smaller. By reducing the wingtip vortices and reducing induced drag as a result, winglets also increase fuel efficiency, decrease takeoff distance, and increase climb performance. Wingtip tanks, as pictured here in this slide, also reduce wingtip vortices, much the same as the winglet. They're just not as efficient as the winglet. Another way we can reduce wingtip vortices and therefore reduce induced drag is with droop tips as pictured here. So again, as airspeed increases as shown on this graph, induced drag decreases. On the other hand, parasite drag increases with an increase in airspeed. This figure shows the induced drag curve, the parasite drag curve, and the total drag curve. Now notice that total drag at slow air speeds is high and then as velocity increases total drag starts to go down until it gets to a certain air speed where it starts to increase again. That air speed is the minimum drag air speed. At that air speed minimum drag is being produced. An important term to remember is LD max. LD max is that airspeed where minimum drag is produced. It's also known as best glide airspeed. So if you are in a powered aircraft and lose engine power, the first thing you need to do is pitch the aircraft to maintain LD max or best glide airspeed. That will allow the aircraft to glide as far as possible because minimum drag is being produced at that airspeed. So to review, induced drag is created by lift. When the wing or airfoil is creating lift, it's creating a wingtip vortex. And the wingtip vortex, which creates turbulence behind the wing, is the primary reason for induced drag. When an aircraft is in ground effect, it is within one wingspan of the ground. So if your aircraft has a 30-foot wingspan, it will enter ground effect when it's at or below 30 feet from the ground. When an aircraft enters ground effect, the surface reduces the wingtip vortices. As a result, induced drag is greatly reduced. In this graph, you can see the ratio of the wing height to the wingspan compared to the percent reduction in induced drag. So just to simplify, if you have a wingspan of 10 feet and you're within 10 feet of the ground, then your ratio is 1. But if you're, ha if you're uh, within 5 feet with a 10-foot wingspan, then your ratio is 0.5. Notice as you get closer to the ground, the percent reduction in induced drag goes up. So if I'm in an aircraft with a 10-foot wingspan and I'm just one foot above the ground, the percent reduction in induced drag is more than 60 percent. The coefficient of lift also increases in ground effect. The two lines in this graph represent the same wing, one in ground effect and one out of ground effect. And at the same angle of attack, 
you can see the same wing in ground effect generates a higher coefficient of lift. As a result of that, the airplane actually flies better near the surface or within ground effect. So how could that be a problem? It could be a problem on takeoff because an airplane might be able to take off at a slower than recommended speed and if the aircraft climbs out of ground effect at that slow airspeed it could settle back to the ground. On landing ground effect could cause the airplane to have a tendency to float. The aircraft could float down the runway before touching down and if it floats too far it may not have enough remaining runway to come to a stop. Because of this problem with ground effect and the tendency of the aircraft to float, airspeed control on final approach is critical. If you maintain a higher than recommended airspeed on the final approach, the aircraft will have a tendency to float down the runway too far because of ground effect. Becoming familiar with ground effect has practical applications when taking off or landing on a short field or a soft field. If you're landing on a short field, then maintaining a slightly slower approach speed than recommended will ensure that you touch down as soon as possible. If you're taking off from a soft field, like a grass field or a gravel field, you want to get the airplane off of the ground as soon as possible in order to eliminate the drag created by the soft field. To do that, we can use ground effect by taking off or lifting off at the uh, slowest airspeed possible, but then staying in ground effect until the aircraft speeds up and then climbing out. Well, that's the end of presentation 15 on the different types of drag. The next presentation will be on the drag equation.